everybody. We're just going to give it a few seconds just to have a few people pop into the webinar and we'll get started in just a minute. All right, let's get started. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our third and final uh, final episode of our Recruiter's Guide series. Um, if you didn't have a chance to tune in to any of the previous ones, you can check them out on YouTube. Our moderator is going to post some of those links in the chat, so you'll be able to see those there. Um, but I mean, stick around for our chat this morning before you go check those out. Um, we'll have the, the links in the chat so you can have a look after afterwards. So the first episode uh, was how to stand out as an applicant. We had a chat about how to put together a really cool cover letter, how to really get the attention of the recruiter. In the second episode, we had a chat with some other recruiters on how to uh, how to be a good interviewer, how to tips for how to how to present yourself well in an interview. Um, and in today's episode, we're going to talk about the COVID job search. Um, so even with the best application and stellar interview techniques, none of it really matters if you can't find a job in the first place. Um, and finding a job can be challenging at the best of times, but COVID has really turned the world upside down and everything seems to be changing. If you're a recent graduate, uh, this season of job hunting can be especially daunting and you might even think that you were given the short end of the stick but what if you weren't uh, so we have our CEO here um, who will hopefully have some thought-provoking uh, insights for you to consider uh, what if COVID was actually an opportunity for you to position yourself at the forefront of this new and changing world uh, so John's our, C our CEO he's our company revisionary uh, but above all he really likes to ask questions dig deep um, and challenge assumptions so uh, we've brought him into today's episode to give us the CEO's perspective on job hunting during the pandemic um, oh, I'm a little bit late on my slides there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so here's John. Uh, myself, I'm Tamron. I'm the uh, chief of staff at Jonar. I work alongside John uh, working on our culture and interviewing lots and lots of candidates. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to touch on one point of housekeeping. We have a Q&A session scheduled towards the end of the uh, session. So if you have any questions, do pop them into the chat and we'll get to them towards the end of the session. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing here so you guys can see John front and center as we dive into our first question, which is, uh, John, how do you think that the pandemic has changed the landscape of work? Well, it's made it really awful. <laughs> if we're going to be honest and we're going to be authentic about things, uh, let's just admit to uh, the, the obvious of it, which is it, change can be very challenging. And this is about as big a change generationally as anybody's ever seen. I would say that um, for us, so my role within the within the recruiting side of, of Jonar, and I, I think a lot of other uh, leaders' roles are a to decide with the individual teams that there's going to be a position in the first place, and b uh, at least for us, I am the last and I guess uh, uh, most challenging interview at the end of the interviewing process. So that's that's kind of where where we come into it. And for most people, what COVID has done is it's made a lot fewer jobs available and it has made those jobs different uh, in the sense of a lot bigger portion of that is, is remote. And remote work is not new. It's been around for a long time, but the advent of it is, and the growth of it and the change to it is that it's pretty much the majority of your time. It isn't something that you're doing one day a week or it's something when you want to extend a vacation, it's something that's pretty permanent. The funny thing is, observing everybody out there right now, what I hear and what I see, uh, what I observe, is that everybody is almost waiting 
you know, with bated breath for things to return to normal, that the, the normal life that we had before is just out there beyond the vaccine line, right? Once the vaccines are out there, everything is going to go back to normal. So if you could just hold on for that. Personally, I think that perspective is a little bit naive and maybe, you know, a, a mistake to rely on that. What's happened here has been a tectonic shift in the paradigm of work, uh, where people live, what their offices look like, uh, what their tasks are, what their schedules are, how management happens, how teamwork works. All of those things are now under siege uh, and being challenged in a way that hasn't been in a really long time. What we've tried to do here and what I think the opportunity is for companies is given that this tsunami of change is coming, you either have the opportunity to get on top of it and do the big wave surfing or to be crushed underneath it. So we're trying really hard to, to surf the wave, to get on top of it and move with the momentum. One of the things that's worth thinking about is the historical context here. So when was the last time that we saw societally that there's been this big of a change to people's everyday lives. You know, if I, if I think about it, there've been a lot of, a lot of disruptions. We had, uh, we had, in Canada, we had SARS, but that was nothing like this. Um, we've had power outages, we've had uh, changes, you know, the internet comes in and devices come in. But if you think about fundamentally, when was the last time that people's day-to-day -day lives globally and ubiquitously were affected this badly? I can't really think of an example uh, more recent than World War II. And for all of us, myself included, that isn't something that we lived through. Uh, but if you look historically what happened as a result of World War II, fundamental things changed. War is awful. Don't get me wrong, I'm no, I'm no proponent of war. Uh, it, it, it's a terrible thing. You know, tens of millions of people died. But it also, at least within North America, it actively smashed uh, the resistance to women in the workforce. You had a huge uh, growth um, of changes of, of uh, people in you know the composition of the demographics in the workforce, and there was a it was a, which was a major stepping stone to uh, women's rights. Uh, you also had, uh, believe it or not, it, it put some cracks in some racial blockages. Right, there were jobs that just weren't uh, available to different different people. That suddenly there was no choice. So when there's no choice systems change. I'm curious to see if some of those same systems come under attack or have to be revised, given that now we have no choice. Fundamentally, why do we have offices in the first place, right? We, ha we have offices because it was an opportunity to bring people together because they needed to be together to share paperwork, to share computer systems, to share you know, other, other types of office resources. But that isn't true anymore, right? You could get fast internet at home. You could get access to all of the information that you need to work from home. And given that now you can't go to the office in a lot of cases, this is really going to change how people work. So how have things changed with the pandemic? Uh, like I said, it, it's a massive change. And I think that the thing to remember is it's pretty permanent. Yeah, I think uh, we're we're kind of at the cusp of a new a new change in the way that we work. So often when people are starting out their career, they kind of get advice to to find an industry that that is the is the best place for them to start their career. With uh, with COVID and you know the changing of the workplace, what industries do you think uh, some of these applicants should should pursue in this day and age? So industry-wise, market segment-wise, uh, there are some major shifts around the world, uh, particularly in North America and Canada, where we are right now, where we're, our expertise is, our economies are becoming more and more um, knowledge-based uh, in terms of knowledge-based jobs. And there's still a need for uh, technicians um, and people doing everything from plumbing to working in service industries and, and things like that. Uh, but a lot of the job shift is moving to people working in, like I said, knowledge-based jobs. 
there, uh, whether you're in healthcare or whether you're in mining or banking or hospitality or entertainment, one of the things that people rarely understand is that all industries to some degree now have become technology industries, right? If you work in healthcare, your ability to use the tools in a hospital, um, your ability to use the tools in a bank, right? Ha have now become absolutely bare minimum requirements in your job, whatever that industry is. So if you're looking at uh, an industry that is growing, and, and I don't think it's wrong to say it's growing exponentially in terms of its uh, inroads into other segments of the market, I think technology is definitely one of them. I think software uh, is definitely one of them. Maybe biased, given that's what we've done. Uh, but if uh, anybody went to look at my career history, I've worked in a lot of different industries, everything from mining to medical devices. So if we look at you know, within this context of human history, what we've been striving for is the ability to increase our efficiency, right? Uh, we haven't always been successful. And maybe even sometimes that efficiency has caused problems, unanticipated problems, but we're always trying to make ourselves able to do more with less time. Uh, hopefully to give us more leisure time, more time with our families, more time to enjoy our lives, uh, rather than spend the majority of our lives you know, hunting and gathering to develop, uh, to get food, just to feed ourselves for today and tomorrow. Uh, but the ability to enjoy everything from art to travel, to communication, to all, all those kind of things. Um, technology is a great industry because it supplies both the leisure side and makes the work side more efficient. So if I had to pick an industry that has seen such massive growth, I think you'd be hard pressed Look at it this way. Some of the biggest what, the biggest companies in the world today didn't exist 50, 60 years ago, right? Uh, we had a very heavy resource-based economy. Um, uh, physicians and medicine have been around for as long as there have been people. Uh, but something that's changed in the last half century has been the, you know, how much digital, particularly digital technology has taken over uh, and grown. I don't think that's going to come to an end. So if you're looking for job security, uh, you know, or, or places where the highest number of jobs are being generated, I'd say technology is a pretty decent bet. Yeah, I think it's fun sometimes to, we, we play this game with some of the new recruits we ask them. Um, so, so Netflix, what kind of company is this? What, what industry would you peg Netflix to be part of? Um, and it, it's interesting because it initially seems like an entertainment company. You know, they, they provide streaming services, but those streaming services are powered by technology. So they're actually a technology company and they're, they're at the forefront of some of the, the technology, um, the technology things in the world. So I, I think it's interesting that a lot of these companies that we, we don't traditionally think of as being part of the tech sector um, are actually technology companies. And right. they don't just look for software engineers or, or technology experts that they, they look for people with a broader background um, because while they are a tech company, you know, they have to run their business as well. Um, that's, so maybe that's, that's something really, we can touch on later. It's no, it's a, it's a really good point. I mean, people don't, we do this in interviews all the time as you ask, you know, what type, type of company is uh, Uber? Is Uber a taxi company? Is Uber a driving, you know, uh, uh, does it, does it get people around? Well, the reality is Uber is a technology company because all it does is really create efficiencies in data and connecting the availability of drivers with the desire for rides. Uh, Airbnb is, for the most part, the same thing. They're not a hotel company. They're not a hospitality company. For the most part, all they are is connecting uh, supply and demand information. Um, Netflix is the same thing. Netflix isn't really, well, Netflix has changed. It now does generate the content, but for a long time, all Netflix did was connect the people who wanted the content with a delivery mechanism uh, for the content. Um, Amazon also for a very long time. Amazon, they weren't making things. Um, and really as a retailer, they didn't, have, they didn't have bricks and mortar stores, right? What they were doing is they were making an efficient mechanism for consumers to find goods that they were trying to buy. So yeah, technology is, uh, it's, it's kind of hard. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's hard to, <laughs> 
you know, unless you're living underground, well, even if you're living underground, you're gonna need technology to survive there too. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the industries. I, I guess the, the conclusion is here that things are moving towards tech. Um, so if, if there are students who are looking to start their careers in tech, what, what kind of companies should they be looking for, especially at the start of their career? So that's a really great question. Um, the reality is, is that technology companies, software companies in particular, have almost developed a reputation for being these you know, great, great environments to work in. Um, but the funny thing about them, at least, and th this is very much my opinion, is that over time there has been, and this has actually changed, I, I think a lot with COVID, over time there was this huge emphasis on perks and benefits. And some of those perks and benefits, you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, you know, uh, making sure that there were always free cookies available um, or, or uh, people who would, you know, companies that would pay for your, you know, putting your winter tires on. Um, and then there were worse things as far as I was concerned, like uh, companies that would pay for um, maid service for your home um, or, or, or things like that, or, or pay for dinners. Um, some of those were a little bit scary as far as I was concerned, because why do they pay for maid service for your home or pay for it for your dinner if you say it work? Well, all of it is a way to get you to stay longer at the office. So they seemed, at first glance, it seemed like it was a way um, to really support the employees. But in the end, it actually was a way to treat people, um, you know, to, to, to squeeze them like fruit to get every last ounce of juice out of them. So I would say if you're looking for companies, try to find, uh, search for authenticity. There's a movement in the world right now, um, a, a belief amongst some leaders, uh, political, business, um, organizational, that the single best way to succeed, to get your, out your positive outcomes is to be truly in partnership across the entire group, right? That employees, are real stakeholders, not just your shareholders, right? So for a very long time over the past 30, 40 years, shareholders and, and driving shareholder profit was the single goal of the company. Uh, but before that, and you know, in, in more recent years, the ability to address other stakeholders, your communities, uh, your environment, uh, your shareholders, your employees, your partners, your customers, all of them, uh, should be thought of when you when you make decisions. So if you start offering dinner at work, is that a benefit that is authentic to help your employees? Or is that squeeze your employees for as much as you can so that you could benefit your bottom line so that you could translate profit back to your shareholders? That's that's the, the the calculus you have to do. That's the calculus that that uh, you know somebody with my job has to do. So our belief at Jonar has always been: let's see if we can build a truly authentic culture where everybody has a has a stake in our success. But success isn't only measured uh, in profits. Success is measured in the health and happiness uh, of the group that we see every day, even if it's, it is uh, remotely and virtually. So trying to find uh, things that will allow for that. We have a saying in our, in our uh, human resources group uh, that people are people, not resources, right? Um, so when we deal with people, yeah, we have rules about how you take a vacation day or how you take a sick day or things like that. But we try really hard not to be dogmatic about it, right? Because not everybody's gonna be the same. Uh, we try to have what we think of as loosely coupled systems so that they're able to adjust. What does that mean specifically to, to you? How do you find these things? Well, not surprisingly, um, reviews are a great way to do it. Do I think looking at the star rating of a company on uh, Glassdoor is great? Well, I mean, there's some value there, but I think that also could be an oversimplification. I think that some people who complain on, um, on a glass door review or on any employer review, you have to look at what those complaints are and you have to look at what the uh, recommendations are. 
Um, I don't have, I always wanted to have a kombucha on tap and they don't have one at my company. So I'm not happy working here. Okay. Is that really something that you want to avoid? Um, I feel like my supervisor treats me with a lot of transparency and their main goal is to see me succeed. That, that's a great recommendation. So I guess what you're looking for in companies are, yes, definitely places that have empathy, uh, but also, especially if you're at the beginning of your career, you want to look for places that actively are interested in teaching you things and letting you learn. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we were talking about industries and the economy in general earlier. One of the things you want to think about is the fact that things change so much faster now than they ever have uh, in history, which means the ability to adapt to change is more fundamental than almost anything else. Going to a place that will not only encourage you to learn that, um, but will actively promote you doing it is a great way to go. I'd say the other thing that I look for is humility for, for maybe that's not the best way to say it, but recognizing, you know, you, you know, you see these, um, you see these companies that think my product is going to absolutely change every little thing about the world. And we are the most important thing. Um, they demand, they, they perceive themselves within the marketplace as much bigger than they actually are. And they perceive themselves within the minds of their employees as far more than they should actually be. So our perspective is any employer employee relationship is two way, not one way. Uh, the employees don't owe us their fealty, you know, and their loyalty forever. Uh, so long as they are being treated well and they're happy and they're working on things that interest them uh, and they're being compensated in a way that they feel comfortable with and they're getting benefits, but they're also giving back the other way so that we feel that they're they're good contributors to the culture as well as the uh, as the, the corporate needs. That's what you want to look for, right? Places that it's a two-way relationship, um, and the company doesn't expect that they're going to own you, right? Um, the ownership of people is not okay. No. Um, I, I think just to, to add on to that, when, when you're at the very beginning of your career, if you have the opportunity to really invest in your learning and growing, it, it can be easy sometimes to be swayed by some of these perks that look glamorous and, and fun and exciting. Well, isn't it cool that I have kombucha on tap at my company? Those are cool things, but I think, um, what is really more, more motivating, uh, is when you're, you're employer and your team really invests in your growth and you you can feel like you're part of something. Um, and so so that's something, I mean, I look for that in, in my career opportunities and I know a lot of people at Jonar, um, it, that's something that they look for. Uh, and when you're early on in your career, um, you, you might have the ability to 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 take possibly you know a lower pay because there is this learning um, environment at a company more so than you'd be able to withstand that kind of financial uh, hit possibly in the future you know when you have kids and a family and other things that are a little bit dependent on you so that's also something to factor in I, I know when you graduate you have debt to pay off and money can be a factor um, but if you can kind of weigh that against the opportunities that you're being presented at a company that's something to also consider and really think about. Um, so John, you, you touched on this, this idea of, of being able to change and be adaptable. How do you think that candidates can, can show that they can fit into this new world? So that's, that's a, a, a really good question. Um, <laughs> you know, hopefully, hopefully he doesn't get upset for me saying this. We, we did an interview, uh, recently for an intern and, um, we, we run a sort of a, a really young internship program, either high school or CGEP students in, in Quebec. And, um, you know, we asked, all right, so what is it that you're bringing to the table, right? It's, it's a very typical uh, 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 interview question. And his response was right out of sort of a business textbook. He says, well, I think, uh, you know, getting your ROI is really important. So I think we, uh, I can help you, inter you know, improve your return on investment. I can raise your revenues, do all these things. And we kind of chuckled and said, that's a, that's a lot to take on for a three month internship, right? As a responsibility. Um, I think that, um, you know, what skills can people position themselves with? Uh, 
you want to be accurate. And the same, the same thing goes for what I said earlier about authenticity of the company. You want to go for, you want to be someone that I or, or our, our managers could, could rely on, right? So you don't want to uh, say I can do anything, right? You don't want to, uh, you don't want to say, uh, you don't want to overpromise, right? You want to basically leave them with the impression that um, you're going to be able to do the job that they want you to do, but there are a whole other set of components that are important to a manager or anybody who's hiring. They want to know that you're going to be able to get along with the other team members. Yeah. They're going to want to know that um, your ego is not going to get in the way. They're going to want to know um, that you're always going to be straight with them kind of stuff. Uh, I, I think they're going to want to know that you don't have the negative things that are going to disrupt. At least that, that's, you know, that's part of what, what we look for. Uh, my role in the interview process is I always kind of joke at the end when they come in, as I say, look, HR and, and, the, and the team have already interviewed you. Uh, my job is just to figure out that you're not a, so, uh, a psychopath, right? That you're not going to blow up our team, right? I, I, I describe myself as the bouncer at the door to protect our culture. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I guess um, we have a few minutes before we dive into the q and I see there's some uh, questions here, but just to kind of wrap things up. I mean, all of these things that we're talking about, they seem uh, pretty great and good um, and good advice for kind of navigating this disaster. But at the end of the day, you know, the COVID situation is still a disaster. So are things really so bleak in the world. So that's actually, um, yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good thing to, to take a look at because they are, right? There's, there's no question that, that the plummet in the number of hires and all that, that's, that's very easy to see. But it's also, historically speaking, the greatest opportunities come with the time of greatest disruption. So, when the world goes through shifts, you see all kinds of, like I was talking about earlier about World War II, it changed, it fundamentally changed certain things. Um, Silicon Valley, for uh, if, you, if you read that uh, history, would not exist without some of the uh, government investment that went into um, you know, the, end of the, the, the later parts and the end of the Second World War. Uh, there are things that uh, make a huge change when we talk about the cloud, for example. Um, 10, 15 years ago, I was having arguments with people who sold servers into, into companies. And they were saying, you know, that this is, this is the business is selling these physical pieces that were going into, into buildings. And I said, this is going to change, right? The real way to get in front of this is to start assuming that all of the resources are going to be on the cloud and you're going to be doing IT remotely. Um, and people who have done that, I mean, Microsoft completely shifted its strategy. People who've done that have done very, very well. So the reality is you could either be on the side of the equation that's desperately clinging on to the way things were, or you could take the opportunity to get out ahead. And if you take the opportunity to get out ahead, those are the people who do exceptionally well once the changes kind of stabilize. So what does that mean in terms of finding your career? Well, finding companies that are at the leading edge, who, who are looking uh, towards how things will be after uh, we've, we've figured out how to handle this new reality. Uh, and you in terms of skills and you in terms of how you're going to perform, the ability to communicate has never been more important and more challenging. Uh, I have been someone who has focused on his communication skills and has been you know, told I'm supposedly an expert in the field for a really long time. Guess what? All of that went out the window when all of a sudden, all of my communication is being done in two dimensions. Uh, there's a huge amount of feedback that you get from seeing people's faces, from getting response from your audience. I used to spend a lot of time talking in front of groups of people. It's a very different experience talking in front of groups of people whose faces you can see than to something like this. Learning how to communicate uh, with groups of people remotely, absolutely essential uh, for, for the things in the future. Something that, that's really strange is that 
on, on another note, it's not just a, the COVID or, or the remote uh, bit uh, of the world. It's that right now, if you're a developer, um, you know, you think your coding skills are the most important thing out there. But what we're seeing more and more is that coding skills are a little bit commoditized. There are God knows how many people graduating from software engineering, computer science uh, degrees, uh, development degrees all over the world. The number of software developers is growing really, really, really fast. And at the same time, you have uh, better IDEs, you have low code environments, you have no code environments, you have AI systems that will be able to write the code itself. Right? You have a lot of these things. So the, the skills to write the code are becoming less and less of a differentiator. Don't get me wrong. If you just spent a bunch of years getting a software engineering degree, it wasn't a waste of time. Uh, but the things that are really interesting and exciting for employers are knowledge of architecture, how things fit together, um, developers who understand user experience in connection with, with coding, right? Uh, people who understand uh, how things are gonna be deployed. Uh, DevOps is a really important, it's way more important of a discipline than it's ever been. And it's going to become even more important when your products are being deployed through the, through the cloud. Um, your ability to have that environment well managed, scalable, all that kind of stuff uh, is absolutely essential. Um, and the ability to work collaboratively. Uh, a lot of companies, us included, uh, use Agile Scrum. Uh, and the ability to work well in standups and in retrospectives in refinement meetings, all those kind of things is really, really useful. So your coding skills can't stand alone, right? Without the complementary, what I guess used to be called soft skills, uh, you're really a lot weaker than you think you are. If you're top in ability to write logical code, but you can't actually figure out what you should be writing, um, you know, we have, we have, we use this, uh, this story all the time. You know, if I come to you as an engineer and I ask you, um, you know, give me this thing that you just built and you hand me this potato peeler, right? And the potato peeler we tested to see, does, uh, does it work in minus 20 degrees? Does it work in plus 20 degrees? How many potatoes can I peel before it breaks or needs to be resharpened? Can I use it left-handed, right-handed, all these things? And it's passing all these tests. And you say, see, I built you this fantastic device. And I said, it's a great potato peeler, but I asked you to make me something to wash my car, right? So it, it's not a great, you know, it's not just a, a verification issue, it's a validation issue, right? Building the wrong thing well is of a lot less value um, than even building the right thing in a mediocre fashion. So understanding all those other pieces around uh, it, it is absolutely critical uh, to how you're gonna navigate all these changes, right? So the combination of learning the skills that you're going to need to put you at the front of that wave uh, of this new reality uh, of the of the because not just COVID, right? Remote work is going to become far more prevalent uh, than it was before, uh, but also the skill set that goes beyond your ability to write, you know, a case statement or or handle arrays or or things like that or a for loop. Uh, that was a great answer. Uh, there's a lot there for, <laughs> for our attendees to kind of dig through. Um, I uh, want to dive into the Q&A session shortly, but John, were there any kind of last thoughts or, or, or last uh, words that you kind of wanted to share with the, with the group before we dive into the Q&A? So I guess I would, I would say um, look for the changes in the future of work. Um, commercial real estate is going to shift because offices are going to change the way they work, right? Um, we, we all know, you know, well, some people have thought about that, about where that's going to happen. Uh, you're even going to potentially, there are people who are talking about how cities and urban areas are going to change because if everybody could work remotely, then lots of people could live in widespread self-sustaining communities around the world and telecommute, right? Um, a lot of the way things used to be is not going to be the same anymore. So ask yourself a question about companies, about your own behavior. If the only reason that I'm doing something a certain way is because that's the way it's always been done, should I still be doing it that way, right? There are opportunities to 
to change things. Um, that, you know, that, that would be look for those opportunities to get out ahead uh, and not be stuck with the way things have always been done. Really kind of, uh, it sums up my introduction of John, which is is asking me thought provoking questions and really digging deeper. Um, so nice. thanks, John, that, that was very well done. <laughs> um, so I hope that uh, that uh, our audience here has has learned some things and, and kind of been given the opportunity to, to dig a little bit deeper at some of these questions. Um, I see that we have a number of questions that have come in through the Q&A function. Um, so we can spend the next kind of 25 minutes going through questions. So I have a question here uh, from Megan, who asks, what are some of the new red flags that we're seeing in interviews now that everything is virtual as compared to before the pandemic? Uh, and then there's a second question on the flip side, what are some indicators that your interviewee is a good candidate compared to before? So uh, that's a good question. I would say that it's not, it's more of what we had before, right? It's not, you know, crazy things that you wouldn't expect. It's, it's more of what we saw, of what was important to us before. So what do I mean by that? Uh, people who are very wooden in interviews, um, people who just give us prepared answers uh, in interviews. Um, I'll, I'll say that at, at Jonar, we use uh, an internship pro uh, program for the vast majority of our recruitment. And the reason we do that is kind of the concept of, you know, you want to date before you get married. Uh, you want to get to know somebody and you're not really going to get to know them that well in an hour long interview. So for us, the impression you want to make is um, that this is, you know, this is an authentic person. Um, people who try too hard. Um, it, it's, it's, it's funny how, how you think about it in terms of dating. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're walking into like a speed dating round in an interview and you want the, the person at the other end to feel comfortable and happy talking to you, right? Uh, if you're trying too hard, if you're not listening, if you're trying to get your script out um, and you're not interacting, um, then you're, you know, it's, it's not gonna fly well uh, with us. I will tell you, um, my, my our, our team knows me that I I typically don't run two interviews the same. Every interview I do tends to be different. And they're, they're always asked, well, where do you come up with these interview? I, they're not, I don't think of them as interview questions. I try to have a conversation with people. Um, you want to get to know a person. That, that's our approach. I, I can't speak really, I, I am awful at trying to tell you how other companies are going to interview you. Um, I can tell you how we do it. Um, and the way we've, we've, we've evolved over, over time is to try and get to know you. So red flags, um, you know, being too stiff. Um, <laughs> we had an interviewee once who came in and told us how much uh, he loved Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I said, oh, that's cool. Why? And uh, he explained that he liked being the dungeon master because he liked holding the fate of all the people in his hands and he could, you know, so that he could kill them in the game if they weren't doing as they were told. Um, and then we ended the interview and I said to Tamara, could you please go lock the door immediately because I was a little bit scared of this person. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, any, anything that's going to make, that's going to make the, the, your counterpart on the other side of the table uh, uncomfortable. Um, and don't bring a script. Right. If I ask you a question and you don't answer it head on, you answer it kind of obliquely because you've already got a prepared answer to something else. Sure, I read your resume already. I wouldn't have come to the interview if I hadn't read your resume. So reading me your resume there, that's a good one. Don't read me your resume. Presume I've already read it, uh, especially if you're at your, your, your not at the first interview at a company. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I, I think there's also um, because things are moving more remotely, um, even just something as simple as kind of showing that you, you're comfortable talking on camera and that you're comfortable having a remote conversation, you know, that kind of sets the ball rolling on on a positive, okay. on a positive yeah. note as well. It also it brings up something else. So, um, I, and again, I don't know if this is targeted like all interviews, and I don't know if all companies work the same way, uh, but we really do tiered interviews, right? So you meet you meet somebody in HR first, then you meet somebody in the team. Then you meet some, you know, and, and then by the, if you're getting to sort of a senior level interview, uh, don't show up late. Uh, don't show up unprepared. Don't show like, 
I, myself and my peers, I, I have zero patience for that, right? If I, I'm a fairly busy guy. If I've taken the time to read your resume, um, you not knowing what our company does or, or any of that kind of stuff, don't waste my time because I will, I will say thank you. That it doesn't happen very often because we tend to get a very high caliber uh, of interviewee. And by the time they get to me, uh, I'm, you know, they're pretty well prepared, but Cameron has seen me cut off interviews, you know, very quickly. Like this, this is obviously a waste of everybody's time. Um, so yeah, if you're getting a senior level interview, don't muck about. Um, we have here another question from Josh. He says that uh, we mentioned earlier that in-person work is on the brink of permanent change. He was wondering if there is something to be said for the psychology of being at work in a social setting, despite that objectively there is no difference with modern technology between working at home and in the office. Oh, God, yes. Um, so uh, yeah. I get made fun of a lot by, by our team. I, I, it's, this has been awful for me. I, uh, frankly, we, personally, I've done lots of things in my career. Why do I keep coming to work? I keep coming to work because I, I like taking on challenging problems with great people. I love having people around. Uh, you know, one of the founding principles of our culture and our, our, our company is that John likes to hang out with other people and do, and do fun stuff. So having everybody at home is totally different, is way less, you know, is way harder to figure out how to, how to get motivated. Uh, we just did, you know, it's a little bit tough uh, in hindsight. We just did a massive renovation of our office space to make it more comfortable. We were in the pro process of doing that when COVID hit. So we now have this gorgeous, beautiful, really great office that nobody's in. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think, I don't think objectively speaking, everything can be done as well remotely as it, uh, as it can be in person. Um, humans pick up a huge amount of their communication and cues from body language uh, that is really important um, in terms of, in terms of uh, the feedback that you get, you get a lot less of it uh, in, in 2D than you do in, in 3. But on another one, from a manager's perspective, a ton of my time, uh, a ton of my, my efficacy was I could feel the buzz, like if people were excited about something or if people were nervous about something, like I'd walk by the marketing department and if they just had you know, their teeth kicked in on something, I would know to stop and sort of check in. Um, people's enthusiasm is a lot more infectious when you're in, in place. So I don't necessarily know how that's all going to be translated to remote stuff. We're trying a lot of experiments. We do a lot of, uh, I, I will say one of the nice things about our culture is that people here are, are, are friends, right? They spend a lot of time together. Um, it's hard to do some of those social activities remotely. We've tried uh, remote escape rooms, right? So we did virtual escape rooms where we all do that. We have an activity every Tuesday morning. Um, what do we do this morning? Everybody, uh, everybody submitted the first album that they had ever bought, and we, everybody was guessing about each other who who bought which album. Um, I, I made fun of the ABBA uh, purchasers. Um, I'm not sure she forgave me for that, uh, but that's yeah. So there's there's a lot of different things uh, that you that we've been trying to do and not all of them have worked. Um, so I don't think we've seen the end of this. I think what's gonna happen is people are gonna keep trying to come up with creative ideas. Uh, and look, and some of them are trite, right? But the reality is we, I, I think that there, there are major, major, major shifts and they're necessary shifts, right? Because we have to adapt to this kind of thing. And some people are going to want to look. What if um, was it Barbados, Tamlin, as a country that offered? Yeah, that opened up uh, like work a, permits for people to come work in a kind of more permanent way. Yeah, um, yeah. The pe people like they said, well, we don't have any coronavirus here. Come work from Barbados for six months or a year until this until this stuff it, it, until all the danger goes away because you're remote anyways. Might as well live on a beach. Um, so yeah. The, there will be there will be changes. Um, currently, I have no doubt that we are in a deficit because we don't spend as much time physically together, uh, and we're going to keep working and finding new ways uh, to to make remote better. But I can't see that it's ever going to be as good. Yeah. So we we actually have a, a question here about that. How would you describe the work culture at Jonah, and how has it changed now that everybody is working? remotely? 
Um, I would say March, April, and May uh, were really hard for people. Um, we were all adapting. I feel like there was a lot of, um, you know, near depression, right? We have a, we have a lot of young staff um, and they, they don't have um, families or people that they live with, right? A lot of them live alone. And uh, suddenly they're being told to stay inside and not see any of their friends and not socialize. And I think that was really hard for people. Uh, some of our team members um, went home, uh, like some of our younger team members uh, went home to go live uh, even internationally with their with their parents and work remotely um, so that they can spend time in their family home. Um, some of them, you know, moved around. Uh, how have things changed? Um, we spend a lot of time checking up. We always checked up on people, right? But it was yeah. easier to do in person. Now we have uh, a chunk of our HR team's job is to regularly check up on everybody. Um, because we, at least we feel it's our responsibility. If you're at home, as a lot, like as almost everybody is, your job is one of the few social, like regular social interactions that you have uh, at, at this point. So we kind of feel it's our responsibility to form part of people's support system. Um, so we're, we're trying really hard to, to, to do that kind of thing. It's not easy. Um, I'd say that, uh, you know, you know what we've done? Um, it, it, it's kind of funny. The team almost informs on each other, right? Like uh, Tamron or I will get a note from one person saying, you know, this person on my team seems a little bit down. Uh, can, can we do something to, to, to help? And it, it almost seems like you're tattletailing, except it's, it's more of a, almost a, a care infrastructure. Uh, yeah. that, that people who don't That's where the motivation is at, you know, if yeah. you're tattletailing on your friend because you're getting them into trouble, that's one thing. But if you're tattletailing because they're struggling and they, they just need a little bit of extra love or a little bit of extra attention, then it's coming from the right place. We, uh, I will say we slowed down hiring because we were in a heavy growth phase. We slowed down hiring a little bit because we were concerned about our ability to maintain our culture and the safety and support system for our existing team if we were just going to be adding, you know, I, I guess in 2019, we, what did we double in size in 2019, somewhere on that order. And then in yeah. 2020, we just haven't been hiring, well, we're hiring, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we'll grow by 10, 15%. Um, yeah. So that's, that's some of the stuff that has changed um, and, and how our culture has tried to adapt to it. Yeah. And I think we've also, we started off by kind of replicating a lot of the cultural things um, that we had in an in-office space. We tried to replicate in a virtual world and we very quickly realized that some of that works, but a lot of it also doesn't work. The virtual world is just not conducive to some of the same types of things that you would have um, in office. So, you know, we, we have an initiative every Friday afternoon where um, it was called beer o'clock, three o'clock is beer o'clock. Um, and you get a beer and you can chat with your, with your coworkers, just kind of take a little bit easier on Friday afternoons. So we spun up a virtual Zoom room where you could pop in and have a chat. And, you know, it, chatting in a virtual world just seems a little bit more awkward um, than in the real world. So we had to come up with other ways to, to facilitate some of these uh, social connections um, and then really also rethink how we engage the team um, completely differently uh, in a way that is way more conducive to virtual engagement than, than physical in-person engagement. So maybe even just talking about culture stuff, there's also a lot of sort of um, just logistical in terms of work stuff uh, yeah. that, that we've done. Um, you know, every problem is an opportunity. Somebody I worked with, I used to work with, used to say, um, our documenting of processes and things that had to get done and requirements and all that kind of stuff, um, our level of it had to go through the roof because you can't just kind of lean over and say, hey, no, I meant this, not that. Everything has to be written down. Our, our communication. Um, so in order to maintain communication that I was saying, March, April, May, I, I our team as well, but I was on meetings from... 6.30 a.m. till 7 p.m. every day uh, for months. It was draining, it was exhausting, just trying to make sure that all of the communication loops were closed. And it took us a while to find, um, so a combination of uh, direct messaging through Slack, um, using better, uh, using diagrams instead of long documents, um, having lots of short meetings. Uh, what, what, what does Irene call it? A Zamboni time? 
is, a, is enough thing. Recognizing that there's always, you got a gap between meetings in people's calendars because people do actually have to go to the bathroom. Um, so like a lot of adjustments to our work habits uh, and those are happening all the time. I guess the, the bottom line is you, you just have to keep your, keep your eye open. Um, if something's not working, and that actually for, for a new employee is a, is a great thing for us. We, we do a lot of interviews with our, our new staff members and ask them, you know, do you have any ideas on how we could do this better? Uh, so that leads into uh, another question actually quite well that we have here from Elizabeth, which is that uh, she's asking, what is the future of HR in the midst of the pandemic? Are there any HR routes or jobs you would recommend going into um, that has the least impact on? Okay, so I would say a year ago, two years ago, I would have said that the single biggest, uh, most important growth role within modern organizations was HR. Um, and now I would say it's even more so. Um, yes. And people, not all companies have realized it yet because a lot of people have slowed down um, their recruitment. But avoiding turnover, um, dealing with the um, mental health issues that will come from isolation, um, finding the right fit within a team, uh, promoting good communication, promoting happiness at work, um, uh, all those kind of things. That's what HR for us is supposed to be. You know, it's funny when we first started uh, as, a, as a much smaller company, we were looking at, at hiring our first sort of HR hire. And the concept of HR was basically a payroll clerk. Your job was to do paperwork. Um, our HR team doesn't do a whole heck of a lot of paperwork. They're not involved in payroll at all. Um, we've automated a lot of sort of like the vacation tracking, things like that. We use an HRM. Um, our HR team's primary focus is the um, growth and maintenance of the culture uh, within the company. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're passionate about, about HR and you're looking for um, play, look, look for company. Again, I, I can't say uh, with definitive knowledge what other companies are doing, but for us, our focus on HR doubled, tripled when, when COVID hit. Yeah, a lot of people are actually curious as to, as to why we have such a big HR team for, for the size of company um, that, that we are, because traditionally as a company of our size would have a much smaller HR team um, but we focus on the people. Um, and so that, that's kind of why well, we have such a big team. So, so actually maybe some numbers will help with that. Uh, our turnover, like your, your average turnover in the tech space, uh, is very, very, very high. Our turnover has gone down to near zero. Um, like it, with the exception of interns finishing their internship, um, we have, uh, I would say we pay, depending on the job, uh, high 50s, mid 60s, high 60s percentile uh, in terms of what other, so we're not, we're not the top payers in the space. We offer great benefits, but not like the, like I said, the, the change your tire benefits kind of thing. Um, the majority of people who work here, I would say work here because they really like what they do. They like who they do it with. Um, and they feel motivated to get up and work each day far more than um, they do the job because you have to do the job to get paid, right? Um, and creating and maintaining that culture uh, is something to look for, I think, in an organization. Um, we have about six minutes left, so maybe we'll have time for two or three, well, one to three questions. We'll see how we go. We have a question here. Um, we focused a lot of this webinar on talking about people early on in their career, maybe even starting their career during the pandemic. Um, I have a question here about uh, somebody who is in the later part of their career. Um, what, uh, they've been in the IT industry for 30 years, but not in software development. They're currently in school to get into this field. Um, is long time experience something to focus on in an interview? Uh, what's your advice to people who are later on in their career and looking for jobs in the pandemic? So this is actually really interesting because we just did something about this. Uh, I think that, um, people's life experience is, is absolutely 
you know, invaluable. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. So um, there's somebody who came to us uh, who applied actually, we, we, we were hiring um, for, for an administration role to help the, the CSO, a CFO work on, um, you know, changing some of our, our uh, financial practices. And one of the interviewees stood out because he had 20 plus years experience in accounting. And we said, um, okay, you, you realize this is an internship. Um, and he said, well, I'm coming from uh, a different country and I don't know all the rules in Canada and things like that. So I figure um, if I could get started, you know, I, I've got a ton of it in, uh, experience, but I, there's a disconnect between it and what I could do on day one. So I'm hoping that by doing an internship, um, I could quickly, you know, migrate to uh, usefulness. Uh, we had somebody who came from um, a building engineering background who wanted to do software product management and she had completely retrained. Um, so personally, I think that there's a lot of value in external experience. Uh, well, for example, Tamron has no, like she, she didn't get her degree in HR at school. She got a psychology degree. Um, so sometimes experience from other fields is actually really helpful. I don't think you underplay it. I think you try, try to find ways to make it relevant inside an interview. Um, okay, and then we'll we'll wrap up with this um, one last question. We talked a little bit about this this candidate who had uh, um, come from a from international experience. Do you feel that employers overall will begin to hire more outside of their home country as remote work becomes more the norm? So um, I want to. Um, I have two challenges. I have two obstacles to being able to do that. Um, one is um, just a very mundane one is time zone, right? Uh, it's hard enough. Like if somebody's at the other end of the world, uh, I would say we'll, we'll call it uh, time zone and linguistics. So your internationalization stuff. Um, it's hard enough for people like we, it, it happens to us all the time. I'm actually notorious in meetings for stopping and saying, you just use this word. It, I don't think it means what you think it means, right? Like I, I, I nail people on vocabulary near constantly because even if you speak the same language, it's really easy in a remote world to have misunderstandings uh, be, because you're not saying what everybody understands. Um, there's a great book by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, his most recent one, um, that ta it talks about this whole matching thing about how people have difficulty understanding each other. Uh, on the flip side, uh, we also are, and I think there are a lot of companies involved in this, we're involved in some R&D uh, tax credits um, that make it difficult. Well, it just makes, us, it makes it a lot easier for us to hire Canadian um, workers because people who are outside of Canada aren't eligible uh, for those tax credits. But having said that, uh, we do have a couple of, of, um, of foreign uh, members of the team uh, because they have specific and highly sought expertise. Um, and this is even pre-COVID. We've had one of our, our most senior people on the development team um, lives and works uh, outside, you know, in, in the Netherlands. So yes, but there are limitations. Um. Cool. Well, I think uh, we're going to wrap up there. I know that there are some other questions that we didn't get the chance to get to, um, but we'll be putting together some follow up material and sending that out to all of the participants. So we'll we'll scan through some of the questions and pull out some of the ones that really were good questions that we didn't have time to uh, to answer today. And we'll we'll include that in our uh, in our follow-up. Um, so thank you, John, first of all, for sharing your insights um, and taking time out of your busy schedule to, um, to chat with me and with our audience here. Um, and then thank you to the audience for tuning in today. Um, like I said, we'll be following up with some uh, follow-up uh, materials. Um, and if you are keen on following some of the things that we're getting up to, make sure that you follow us on Instagram and 
and LinkedIn um, and some of our other social media feeds. That's where we post a lot of the updates about jobs coming up, but also um, other content, uh, particularly for HR and uh, HR professionals and uh, applicants looking for jobs. So stay tuned there um, and you'll hear about all the new things coming down the line. Um, so thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of your day.